True West's cover of Pink Floyd's Lucifer Sam on Revenge of the 80s Radio, fans of LA Punk and New Wave saw the emergence of Paisley Underground music. True West core members Gavin Blair, Richard McGrath, and Russ Tolman went on to do various interesting projects, and Russ is with me now as he released a retrospective of his solo work over the past three decades, Compass and Map. Welcome to the show, Russ. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Before you were known as True West, the band as constructed was known as The Meantime. What brought you from the beginning of The Meantime to the sound and ascension of True West? Well, I think we need to go back a little farther than that. Uh, in the late 70s in Davis, California, um, we were all DJs at a, at a, a radio station, college radio station called KDBS. And uh, Steve Wynn, who later went on to form the Dream Syndicate with Kendra Smith, they were both uh, uh, DJs there, and so was I. And uh, we all t- got together one day and said, hey, let's start a band. And so we started a band called Suspects, and we put an ad in the paper for a a bass player and a drummer, and uh, who should arrive with Gavin Blair, who would later become the singer in True West. Uh, we uh, were a band for a couple of years, Suspects. We made a single, and uh, around 79, uh, Steve and Kendra went back to Los Angeles, uh, where they are from originally, and uh, then I was off uh, in this other band called Meantime, and uh, we had a single that was produced by David Gates, a bread of all people, and then... Um, then coming uh, into the early 80s, Dream Syndicate started and True West had kind of uh, formed out of meantime with uh, Gavin Blair as as the singer. And uh, then we brought aboard Richard McGrath, who was uh, my guitar hero, local guitar hero. And uh, we kept the Lucifer Sam single and we put the uh, same song backwards on the other side, not only as a tribute to Psychedelia, but also uh, just so that people would only play the A side. What became known as Paisley Underground Music was a, a new twist, uh, I guess a punkish twist on a combo of 60s psychedelic rock and some of that decade's great garage bands. Did you kind of fall into that sound or was that something you wanted to achieve? Yeah, going back to that original band, uh, Suspects, who, you know, our ad in the newspaper said, you know, we're really into punk, new wave and 60s garage. So, uh, you know, that was something that I was always into, and, and Pink Floyd's first album, uh, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, with uh, the Loose for Sam track on it, was uh, big on the on the playlist, as well as uh, the San Francisco sound bands like Quicksilver Messenger Service and uh, uh, the Paul Butterfield Blues Band album East West, which I think defines that uh, kind of two guitar interplay thing that True West was really uh, was really known for. We talk about the great garage bands of the 90s, 2000s, and today, and there are a lot of them, but maybe not covered as much, and that's likely because we have had the internet from the 90s on, were the great garage bands of the 60s. Who were some of your influences at the time, or from that time? Uh, Yeah, uh, Shadows of the Night, uh, The Seeds, uh, all those those bands that had uh, hit records out of nowhere in the summer of 1966, uh, before... You know, before the whole San Francisco sound thing hit, there was uh, quite a few bands on in- indie labels that just happened to get on Top 40 radio. Um, question Mark and the Mysterians, all that stuff. Uh, you know, two guitars, bass, drums, maybe a Farfisa or a Vox Continental. That sound, that Paisley Underground sound, what brought that and, and you guys, True West, a huge following in L.A.? Well, you know, it, it was interesting. I think the Paisley Underground more than being a sound, was a bunch of bands that had a kinship and uh, kind of moved together and started doing uh, doing shows together and uh, in some cases hanging out together and stuff. Uh, we were kind of the, the Northern California guard of that. Uh, we never moved to Los Angeles. Uh, as all these bands started to uh, get... Uh, notoriety and and get a little bit of fame uh you know we started meeting up on the road you know in places like uh, boston and oklahoma city and london and uh you know so that there was a lot of kinship there but i don't think any of the bands really i think it was we all kind of came together because we were the weirdos doing uh 60s influenced music in in the 80s in the time when uh 
you know, guitars were either dinosaurs that were never going to be used again, or they were, you know, the, the tools of air metal bands. Guitars will never fall. I'll tell you that. That's just the way it is. And it even incorporated a lot into New Wave as the years grew on. This was part of it. Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, you know, there were, there were guitars in New Wave, but, uh, you know, there was a real period of time, you know, the whole New Romantic and Flock of Seagulls and, and all those English bands where, you know, guitars were, Oh, they're they're on their way out. You know, it's going to be synthesizers and computers and blah blah blah. But luckily, uh, you know, guitars have uh, managed to uh, just exist just fine. And uh, you know, uh, I like that. With me is Russ Tolman on Revenge of the '80s Radio. His solo retrospective, Compass and Map, is out. We'll talk about that because the band broke up in 1985, and you started that solo career. What did you want to do as a solo artist that you felt you might not have been able to do as part of True West? You know, I just wanted to keep uh, making records, and uh, certainly when you're in a band and you're really trying very, very hard to uh, to make it, um, you know, a lot of touring. We spent uh, about two and a half years constantly in a van all around America and Europe. And uh, at a certain point, you know, uh, differences, you know, it's like marriage. It's like being married to four other people and a, and, and a manager. So uh, this, this call out very married five people, uh, you know, it take it takes its toll eventually. So what I, I was looking forward to as a, as a solo artist was to be able to, to do songs and, uh, do music and uh, not have a committee. And, uh, you know, I was very, uh, I, I never sang in True West. So here I was, you know, going from being songwriter and guitar player to being a uh, friend guy and singer. And that was, uh, that was quite a frightening, uh, that was quite a frightening thing. It makes sense. Totem Poles and Glory Holes was that first album, Russ. And this is the time when you were able to take control of what was going on, your music. Talk about some of the creative things you did do in that album you didn't do with uh, with the band. Well, I, I did I did produce the True S record, so it's not like I didn't have some uh, big say in how things sounded. But uh, with my first solo album, Totem Poles and Glory Holes, I wanted it to be this big ball of noise, which it, it turned out to be. Um, I at the time I was recording it, I was really uh, loving the Jesus and Mary Chain, whose uh, first records had just come out in Britain. And, uh, you know, I, I liked the idea of great songs, but, uh, you know, behind a wall of noise. And so that's kind of how uh, Totem Poles and Glory Holes turned out. Among your other career highlights is you could be heard making some vocal sounds on Concrete Blonde's free album, as Jeanette Napolitano did some singing on an album you recorded around the same time down in Earthquake Town. It's true. And uh, I think she also sings on uh, my Sweet Spot album as well, on a song called the best is yet to come, which um, I believe also appears on Compass and Map, if my memory is serving me well today. Uh, yeah, I met Johnette uh, back in True West days around uh, 85. Um, she and Steve Wynn were very good pals. And uh, so, yeah, in fact, I remember uh, uh, w when True West was touring with REM, we were playing at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles, and I was out with Steve and uh, Johnette drinking too many margaritas, eating Mexican food, and I missed uh, missed sound check. And uh, after our set, spent uh, spent a good long time with Warren Zevon backstage talking about sobriety and AA, which uh, at that point in time was probably something I could use. That's always important. I mean, sometimes not. Just... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, my 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 consumption of adult beverages was a little in in excess in, at that point in time. I mean, how did you manage to overcome that? Yeah, it was just that was a particular kind of an unhappy period of time where it was very stressful with uh, True West, and we were, you know, even though we were touring with REM, which was you know a great opportunity, it was sort of like uh, it was just a, a reason for me to. Uh, drink a case of beer before and after the show. So uh, there you go. Well, going back to Janet Napolitano, there is something about her voice, when, especially when she's doing a duet or, or adding to uh, another artist's song, that makes you just want to stop and listen. You have to. Yeah, she's, she's a singer. She, she, she just, you know, is one of those people that has the uh, God-given gift of a, of a wonderful voice. And it's, it's got uh, 
it's got some grit to it. Uh, I've heard her compare it to Mavis Staples, and I kind of, uh, I kind of buy that. Um, it, it's just she's, uh, she's. She's, uh, I, I, I'm at a loss for words. She's just a talent. It's impossible to describe. And she's on the Compass and Map album, as you said. And that album, as we said, is a retrospect of your work over the years, your great work over the years. I've noticed your guitars in the early solo albums were generally heavier, and that kind of changed as you created new music in the next few decades, including your own uh, Russ Tolman band these days. What are the most glaring, in, in your opinion, what are the most glaring similarities and differences between your songwriting during the early solo career and the recent years and today? Uh, yeah, I think you kind of hinted on it, that it was more guitar-oriented. I mean, coming out of True West, we were, we were too we were big fans of the two guitar thing and uh, big fans of television uh, out of New York. And in fact, so much that uh, Tom Verlaine, he produced some recordings through us back in uh, 83. And so, you know, I was still kind of on that, uh, on that tip. And um, I was playing at that point with a fellow named John Clagis in the band. And John had been in Richard Lloyd of television's band back in New York. And so, you know, there was a lot of opportunities for that. But as time moved forward, I, uh, you know, kind of got more into the less of the rock band thing and more of the solo singer songwriter, and uh, I think that's more where I am now, um, kind of embracing my folk and country roots a little bit more. Um, I used to be back uh, in the late '70s and early '80s a country DJ, and it was a very strange station in that we didn't play top 40 country at all it was uh at that point in time it was either called progressive country or outlaw country but it wasn't really we did play the waylands and willies and stuff that were considered outlaw country but we also played a lot of folk labels and and just you know terry allen and people that just fall between the cracks um and at that point uh, joe wheelie jimmy dale Gilmore, and some of those guys um so um I, you know, the, it, it was always kind of something that kind of called to me the, uh, you know, in fact, it was frightening. I always have this tendency to do the thing that's the most frightening. And I don't know why, but the most frightening thing at that point in time to me was the idea of being a solo singer songwriter. So that's what I've been moving towards, uh, I think my whole career. And also just trying to write great songs, trying to write a song that's like a standard that will stand, you know, for, for time. I don't know. I don't know if I've gotten there yet, but uh, hopefully I have time to uh, to do that. Frightening is good. Normal is boring. I do know, though, Russ, you did a lot of work with Robert Lloyd over the years consistently. Yeah, Robert uh, has, has been a good pal, and he's, he's such a talented multi-instrumentalist. Um, I actually met Robert first back, you know, through the Dream Syndicate. He was, he's a writer. At that point in time, he was writing a column for the LA Weekly, and now he's TV critic for the LA Times, but uh, when he has his uh, musician uh, superhero, uh, superhero uh, uniform on, he's uh, a great mandolin player, an organ player, piano, uh, guitar, uh, accordion. And I mostly use him for his uh, organ uh, when we're playing the electric gigs, and then um, backs me up on with mandolin and uh, accordion uh in uh in the more acoustic shows robert lloyd was also a member of the lopez beatles we had bruce rotowald on a few months back yeah uh robert was the guitar player in uh, in the lopez beatles and i moved to la in 86 and i think by that point in time they they had uh, you know phase one of the lopez beatles story was over and so i never actually saw them but uh robert he can play anything he's he's amazing I, he actually i think also plays a little violin and I, I need to ask him about it because we have a show coming up in a couple of weeks at McCabe's here in Santa Monica, which is a, a famous, uh, famous folk place. It's actually a guitar shop where they do uh, they have uh, a stage and room for a hundred or 150 people in the back. And uh, Robert, uh, yeah, I think he needs to debut his violin skills there. <laughs> With me is Russ Tolman of True West and of his long solo career on Revenge of the 80s Radio. And you also discovered some talent as producer and owner of the Interstate Records label. You know, my my uh, thing with producing records kind of goes back to uh, uh, True West times. Uh, I uh, produced some 
demos for Thin White Rope. I think that was some of the first stuff that I did. And then there was a band called 28 Day out of Chico that uh, we uh, produced and got a record deal with uh, Enigma Record for. And, and the lead singer or one of the singers for that band was Barbara Manning, who then in the 90s went on to a pretty good indie career on Matador Records. Um, then uh, fast forwarding to the late 90s, um, yeah, I just started a record uh, label called Interstate, and basically the idea of Interstate was not really discovering new talent, but uh, there are a lot of artists like myself who had careers in the U.S. but didn't have record deals, but uh, had deals in Europe and pretty thriving careers in Europe. Um, and so the idea was to uh, uh, provide an outlet uh, for artists like Penelope Houston. Um, Tom Heyman. Uh, please forgive me if I don't remember all of them right off the top of my head. We put out about a hundred, put out about a hundred releases between 1998 and 2006 when the label folded. And uh, people like uh, Sister Double Happiness, uh, just people who had had some following, uh, pretty good following in Europe, still have following here, but just basically weren't labels that would put them out. And so, you know, we were kind of trying to operate there. We weren't trying to break artists. We're just trying to get new records out to an audience that already existed. And that worked pretty well. Um, you know, certainly we didn't have the marketing budgets to, to break new artists. So, and uh, from an A&R point of view, it makes it a lot easier too. You're, you're you know, you're putting out things by that you already know are going to sell a certain quantity so uh interstate was the, it was a, a good thing at the time and uh i have to give a shout out to my uh pal pat thomas who was my associate in interstate records and pat uh he's uh gone on to become a quite a noted author he did a book called listen whitey uh his specialty is the uh confluence of black radicalism in the Black Panthers and pop music and soul music uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. And uh, he also does a lot of reissue producing. And uh, I met Pat. He was a video guy uh, at the station in, in Rochester, New York. And, you know, he, he picked me up and we we're going to the station for a, uh, for a interview. And so we had this, this is this most intense discussion in the car and he asked me all these questions that were going on. And then we got to the station and I was like, okay, what do you want to talk about now? We had just totally <laughs> run out of juice. We had nothing to talk about once the, once the microphone came on. It was, it was pretty hilarious. <laughs> Russ, 27 years as a solo artist is tough to capture properly, even in a 20-song retrospective album. So what are some songs that didn't quite make the cut? What are one or two past tracks that you might want to have had on the album or, or would like new fans to take a listen to after hearing Compass and Map? Uh, you know, that's a really good question. There's seven albums that this pulls from, and, you know, I'm trying to make it a very you know, kind of a, a good sampler for somebody who may have never heard me before. Uh, a lot of folks said, oh, you didn't put enough stuff from the first album, Totem Poles and Glory Holes. And actually, yeah, there's only one song from there, but it sounds so much different than the rest of the album that, uh, you know, it, it, it was, if I put too much, it would have been too much of a departure. Um, I think the album Sweet Spot is really good and doesn't, uh, doesn't have enough representation as well as uh, the city lights album. So, you know, those are all available on the digital services. You know, you can listen to them on Spotify for free. And I would uh, suggest going, you know, going and checking them out. Are you going to hit the road to support the album? Absolutely. Um, well, including uh, we got McCabe's coming up uh, here in June and then take a little break. And then in August, I go out on tour uh, the whole West coast um, starting up in Seattle and then coming down here to uh, to Los Angeles. And that's going to be along with uh, this uh, group. It's actually uh, a, a main guy named uh, Stephen Murphy, and he was in a fabulous band called The Mighty Steph out of Dublin, uh, Dublin, Ireland, uh, for quite some time. And they recently packed it in. Uh, and in the last two years, he has managed – to put out two albums under the name Count Vaseline. And uh, they're amazing records. In fact, uh, for me, 
there's every there's everything that I loved about the '80s in those records. There's a lot of uh, I don't know. There's, he brings together a lot of influences. Uh, it's kind of a confluence of the Fall and uh, Echo and the Bunny Men, and uh, oh, maybe going back to the Velvet Underground and uh, a little television. A lot of stuff all kind of together. With he's just an incredible songwriter. Uh, so people should be checking out uh, Count Vaseline. Russ Tolman, thank you for coming on Revenge of the 80s Radio with us to talk about Compass and Map. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Let's play a track from Compass and Map from 2013 and on the album Los Angeles. Russ Tolman on Revenge of the 80s Radio. <laughs> 